It's my firm belief that just as we can take the healthy eyes of a condemned criminal after his execution, and with these alien eyes, restore sight to a deserving blind man, so also can we successfully transplant other organs and members of the body, attaching and grafting them where needed, even in cases where important arteries and nerve centers have been severed. Professor Frankenstein, how can you ask us to believe such a preposterous theory? I beg your pardon, Dr. Randolph. I said I believe your theory is preposterous. Now, we're all men of science. We know about transplanting eyes and the special factors involved in transferring the cornea. But these other claims of yours, well, they're just beyond the pale of experimental medicine. You seem to forget that the higher purpose of experimental medicine, no matter how extreme, is simply to establish scientific truth. Any student of gross anatomy would refute you. And I still say that dead tissue cannot be reactivated. By my own son, a high school sophomore wouldn't swallow your theory. Dr. Randolph, I think you're being disrespectful. All right, if I am, so I'll apologize. I've listened patiently to your theories through this whole seminar. I haven't missed one session since you were brought from England to be our guest lecturer. Some of your pronouncements are brilliant. But this pet theory of yours, which you've mentioned more than once, uh, I'm sorry, never. Very well, Dr. Randolph. You cling to your skepticism. I'll hold to my beliefs. And someday, very soon possibly, I'll prove them so conclusively that even cynics like you all over the world will be convinced. Well, I think that's all. Good day, gentlemen. Patience, Dr. Carlton. Did you check the sweep voltage? Probably not. It seems that Dr. Randolph's remarks upset me more than they did you. Weren't you disturbed at such insolence? No. No, as a matter of fact, in some ways, I'm rather grateful to him. He forced my hand. And since you defended me so valiantly, and you're my close ally and fellow worker, our hand. Our hand? Yes. You always supported me in all my theories in experimental medicine. Now you can help me prove them. How? Dr. Carlton, I plan to assemble a human being using parts and organs from different cadavers. You mean take one person's hand and, and another's leg? Yes, why not? Simply an intelligent adaptation of the principle of selective breeding. After all, if you breed morons, you beget morons. But when brilliant people mate... There are still risks, throwbacks. I eliminate all risks. I'm carrying the principle of selective breeding one step higher. You mean, of course, under the sponsorship of some medical institution? No. On my own. Right here, in my own laboratory. You can't be serious. You, you don't dare. Don't dare. Don't dare. You know, I'm sure that someone spoke those same words and hurled that same challenge at that great ancestor of mine whose name I bear. Now, believe me, I'm serious. You see, the knowledge, the know-how, as you Americans put it, is in my blood. It's my heritage. But where Baron Frankenstein created a monster, I shall bring forth a perfectly normal human being able to walk among normal people undetected. I'll point the way to perfection in the human race. Well, I, I applaud your ambition and I, I admire your courage, but when you propose to carry them out, I, I don't think I can help you. You see, I'm not a doctor of medicine. My degree is in physics. I know all about your qualifications, your research, your studies in X-ray, and that's exactly what I need. I'll provide the surgery. You'll provide the electronics. But you're reaching for the supernatural. To assemble a human being. I shall use only the ingredients of youth. Not the worn-out body inhabited by an overtaxed brain. The old are dying, are dead. 
The whole trend is toward death. But if I'm successful, if I can create out of different parts a youth whom I shall instruct and control, I'll prove that only in youth is there any hope for the salvation of mankind. loaded. Back from a party, I guess. Head-on collision. What a crash. I was right behind him. Jammed my brakes on as fast as I could. Seems to me I saw one kid thrown clear in the air. Over there somewhere. I call the police. Did you go over to him? Oh, not me. I, I can't look at that sort of thing. That kid had bleed to death before the police get here. I think he's had it. Terrible. Terrible. completely burned in the crash, they won't be able to check. Stop shaking. It's cold in here. Well, it should be. I keep the temperature of the vaults at 36. Ideal for unembalmed bodies. Temperature of a morgue? Well, this is a morgue. My private morgue. This is where we will experiment and work. No one can disturb us here. What condition is he in? Tell me, what condition is he in? Dead. I know that. That's the way a layman would describe him. But I also know, and I want you to remember, but in this laboratory, there is no death until I declare it so. Now, describe his condition. Well, the head's crushed in. Possible brain injury. Face is beyond recognition. I, I, don't, I don't know about the rest of the injuries. Dr. Carlton, you're a scientist. You mustn't be squeamish. I've seen worse. Anyway, the face is a comparatively simple replacement. If the brain is uninjured. Now, help me store this body for the night. Tomorrow we will begin. a few parts. Normal preparation for an experiment that will determine the fate of the world. Electrical equipment also. I've been assembling necessary parts for some time. As a matter of fact, in every city where I've lectured, I've made it a point 
to purchase one or two things that we'll need. We're quite ready to put everything together for our experiment. Professor, perhaps you'd better try and find another assistant. I, I don't think I have the stomach for this. Dr. Carlton, don't underrate yourself. I'm the best judge of your qualifications. I need you. And you need me. After all, that other experiment that you assisted me in about a month ago made you my ally. Of course, I could use another and uglier word, accomplice, but I won't. But when you started that, I, I didn't know. You made me believe that you were writing a book. Now you know I wasn't. And remember, it's too late to retreat. Now, I don't want to hear anything more about it. We're in this together. I'll want you to assemble a small synchrotron, something in the 100,000 volt category. After each surgical move, I'll need the advantage of high velocity x-rays with a penetration of at least two inches. Parts are all here. Do as I say, and you will share in the greatest experiment science has ever made. Well, Carlton, I think we'd better go and change our clothes for the party. May I propose a toast on behalf of all of us to Professor Frankenstein, a true servant of science. And may I add that we'll miss his stimulating lectures when he has to return to his native England. Well, let me thank all of you for listening to my theories and for your unfailing hospitality. I do have to return as I'm only a guest in your gracious country, but I shall miss you. To all of you. Would you excuse me a moment? Margaret, you didn't join in the toast. Well, I, I couldn't. It would be saying goodbye. I'm just not up to that yet. You know, there are many things I admire about you. Perhaps your honesty, most of all. You know I'm going to miss you. As your nurse? No, as a devoted friend. That's not enough. Or am I being too honest? Well, you're being true to yourself and your sex. You know perfectly well. Science has proved conclusively that in all forms of life, the female pursues the male. Do you enjoy being pursued? By you, yes, especially when I'm caught. What do you mean? I mean, it isn't easy for a scientist to disassociate himself from his work. And that's why I, well, I thought that we could work together closely so that soon we might be together. I'd like that. Margaret, in the next two months before my visa expires, I'm going to be engaged in the most important experiment of my life. You could help me enormously, more than I could ever repay, by becoming my assistant. Of course, I, I realize that would mean you'd have to give up your nursing post at the university hospital. You mean a temporary leave? Why temporary? I'm a man as well as a scientist. When my experiment is completed successfully, we could go back together, if you'll have me. You now they tell me the Queen Mary's an ideal setting for a honeymoon. <laughs> Darling, of course I accept. I want you to keep all disturbing factors away from me. Answer phone calls, mails, put off visitors, interviewers, requests for articles and periodicals and so forth, and postpone all my appointments. I want to see no one but my associate, Dr. Carlton. And of course you. I'll be the best watchdog you ever had. Of course, I'll have to give up my room at the uh, hospital. Oh, well, I suggest you move in here. You could have a wing to yourself, and Mrs. Dietrich, the housekeeper, would be the chaperone. If we feel we need one. Sounds wonderful. I'll move in tomorrow. His hands 
And the right leg, practically up to the knee, are completely crushed. You'll have to amputate. Yes. Above the carpal bones, and, uh, well, below the patella. Yes, they'll have to go. Here. Apply the cathodes. Activate him first. But why? In this frozen state, he won't feel anything. I want him to know and feel pain, so that when I alleviate it, he'll also know gratitude. Now, change his body temperature to normal. What I create, I must control. Go on, activate this body. I'll begin with 50,000 volts. Frankenstein's residence. I'm terribly sorry. He's seeing no one. Well, if you care to leave your name. Later, I'll give him a transfusion. I'll select the blood myself. How... How are you going to dispose of those? You can't bury them or burn them. There's always danger of discovery. I'm not aware of that, Doctor. I provided for this emergency, too. final resting place for bones and tissues I'll never need. Now I have to get two hands and a right leg. Believe me, I'll see to it that the replacements are an improvement over the originals. Oh, dear doctor, you look as if you could stand a drink. Come on. Scattered and partial remains of the Plymouth track team wiped out two days ago when a chartered plane attempting a landing in a thick fog crashed into the wild mountainside will be interred this afternoon in Fallbrook Cemetery. Poor boys. Oh, tragic. All those fine young athletic bodies, all those hours of training for strength, speed, endurance, gone to waste. <laughs>
rather neat. I do say so myself. Hands and leg are back on his body. I've kept my promise. Strong hands of a champion wrestler and the leg of a football star. Yeah. You've got a great deal to thank me for, my dear boy. With the special healing fluids and the vital rays, his bones should knit in a day or two. What is impossible for others becomes a daily event for you. I'm delighted to impress you. Now help me put him back. My, that was a nice dinner. It's an excellent roast, didn't you think so, Margaret? I don't enjoy food the way you do. Maybe you need a little more exercise. The doctor and I work so hard, we're ravenous. Uh, will you excuse us, my dear? I have some voluminous notes to complete. What's the matter? You're sulking. Good night, Margaret. Good night. Well, how do you think I feel being left alone all day? And in the evening, you either lock yourself in your laboratory with your experiment, or you spend hours in your study writing up your notes. It's not much fun for me. Oh, you know I... I hate to upset you. I... Well, I plead guilty, Margaret. I have neglected you. There just seems to be more and more work to be done. The pure, clear flame of science, as Huxley put it, is a hard taskmaster. But tonight, I'll put it behind me. Tonight, I'm yours to command. Now, what would you like to do? Anything, just to get out, to be with you, alone. A cinema? Or a drive? That's it. A nice, long drive. We can talk. And make plans. And relax. Over there. Let's park and just look at the view. And talk. Like others have the same idea. They come up here for some quiet necking. It's a lover's lane. Oh, that's interesting. Sort of a private preserve for teenagers, huh? Well, I suppose as adults, we're lucky to find a parking space. But we'll turn on the radio and do what the teenagers do. They tell me it's loads of fun. Good morning, my boy. Come, come, my boy. Say good morning to your creator. Speak. You've got a civil tongue in your head. I know you have, because I sewed it back myself. Yes, and all healed up very nicely, if I do say so. Perhaps, Professor, it's too soon for him to speak. Nonsense. With all the surgical skill and the vital rays lavished on him, he should talk like a, like a congressman at a filibuster. Now, come on, my boy. Say good morning, and say it to me. You do have vision, you know, at least in the one eye. And your brain is intact. We'll improve it in time, but no malingering now. Now, come on. Watch my lips. Good morning. You must speak, because time is desperately the essence. Are you sure you're not rushing him? It's only a few days since... All right, nonsense. He can hear and he can understand, and he must learn to coordinate so he can speak me very carefully. I command you to watch my lips and repeat after me. Good morning. Good morning. Well, my boy, you'll be chattering like a magpie. But believe me, you'll be making more sense. I'll see to that. Ah, you see, persistence has its rewards. That's all I want of him this morning. Now, Dr. Carlton, can you accuse me of being cruel? Put him back. Professor, I think he wants to say something else. I like a young man with initiative. Go ahead, my boy. Take your time. I'll listen patiently. Say whatever you please. It's 
dark in here. Dark. Yes, it is dark for you. But you'll have to reconcile yourself to the darkness because you're going to be in the dark a long, long time. Professor, look. Why, it's amazing. He's actually crying. Can you imagine? Even the tear duct functions. The entire world will be astounded. Well, it seems we have a very sensitive teenager on our hands. Come in. I can't. The door's locked. Yes, dear, what is it? Well, aren't you going to let me in? It's your fiancé, not the police. Of course. Come on in. I'm sorry, but I just can't be interrupted. I... However, now that you're here... Well, if you're in a cross mood, perhaps I'd better wait. Oh, no, no. Come on. Come on now. Well, I want to talk to you. Even though the wedding is informal, plans have to be made. Details have to be worked out. The minister, the, the church, the guests. A girl doesn't get married every day. After all, this is the most important event of my life. I know, but I can't discuss it now. I've got too much work to do. Right now, the most important event in my life is my experiment. You don't have to tell me that. I've never seen such an example of devotion. By the way, dear, what is your experiment? Uh, until I'm successful, it's a deep secret. Even from your future wife? Even from my future wife. When the right time comes, you'll be the first to know. Well, if you won't tell me, I might have ways of finding out for myself. Such as? What ways? Tell me! Answer me! I didn't mean anything by it. It just slipped out. Words sometimes do. I have no intention of spying on you. I don't care if you ever tell me. Oh, that's better. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, darling. Forgive me. I, I know this experiment must be getting on my nerves. But you understand a scientist's devotion to duty. I'll be finished soon. Then we'll be married. And off on our honeymoon. Forgive me? Yes, of course. I'll leave you to your work now. I, I won't interrupt you again. Good. Oh, by the way, Dr. Carlton and I will be leaving in ten minutes. We have some extensive purchases to make this afternoon. Will you uh, delay all inquiries by saying that I'll be out of town for three days? I must have 72 hours of uninterrupted work. Of course, darling. I I'll go back to my kennel quietly and be the best watchdog you ever had. fish and trunk. i never seen a key like this since I left the old country. Thank you.
Now, come, my boy. If we're going to impress a skeptical world, we'll have to make faster progress. Watch my lips. Observe them carefully, each and every move. They will guide you. Yes. Yes, sir, would be preferable. In England, you know, we have a little more respect for the older generation. Yes, sir. That's better. Better articulation, too. Now, concentrate. And repeat after me. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Very good. I knew that a young mind would respond better than an old one. Now, that's all the mental work for today. Our main concern is with your physique. Let me see if you can clench and uh, unclench your hands like this. You do that 100 times each day. I want you to enjoy equal power in both hands. But remember, I am the one to tell you when and against whom to raise them. I will avail. Yes, I'm sure you've learned that lesson, too. Now your new leg. Stand up in it. Hmm. It's quite satisfactory. Sit down. I want you to exercise that leg, too, the way I showed you. Understand? It's very important to keep the blood flowing smoothly in order to ensure proper circulation. Professor, I think he needs some supplementary nourishment. Yes, I prepared some special vitamins. I'll give them to you. I'm going to leave you with Dr. Carlton now. He'll give you some electrical treatments and feed you. You do as he tells you. And tomorrow, I'll set up some exercise equipment for you. Excellent, my dear boy. Excellent. Well, your new hands are getting stronger every day. Well, you, can, you can rest now. You know, with your remarkable mental and physical progress, and of course your obedience to me, you've made me very happy. Someday you and I are going to astound the world. A wunderkind created by me, a teenage marvel. What's the matter? Aren't you pleased with all this? You are happy. But I am not. Why? Because you make me live down here. When will I walk among people? Don't badger me. You keep asking that question again and again. You will walk among people when I feel the time is right. When will that be? Never? You dare question me? I want to know. Why not now? I'll show you why not now. Turn around. I'll leave your face the way it is. I'll make sure you don't leave until I'm prepared to give you a new face. Look again, my boy. You'll be glad to stay here until I make you fit to go among people.
Seven foot tall. No, he was uh, shorter, but built solid. Broad shoulders, heavy arms. His face, what there was of it, it was terrible. Terrible. If you ask me, he wore a mask, like those guys who hold up supermarkets. Well, one thing for sure, he was strong. He hit me like, like I was a baby. I've never been hit so hard. Have any of you ever seen him before, hanging around here, prowling? No, never. Never, and I hope I never see him again. All right, folks, the alarm is out. He can't get too far. We've got the street blocked off. We'll make a check of all the houses in the neighborhood. Now, why don't you all go back to bed and get some sleep? I'll be on the safe side make sure all your doors and windows are locked. And it was you. I had to get out. I wanted to see people. But they saw you. Yeah. Now you know the truth. Yes, I frightened them. Everybody who saw me, they ran. I told you they would. But I didn't mean to hurt. Hurt? You killed a young woman. You got the police down about our heads like a pack of baying dogs. By disobeying me, you not only endanger our lives, but you put my whole experiment in jeopardy. I didn't know. From now on, I'll obey you. It may be too late. As a matter of fact, in order to protect myself, I should do away with you altogether, destroy you as dangerous evidence. No, please don't. I'll do what you say. Now you better. There's a slim chance I may still be able to cover up for you. But from now on, you do exactly as I tell you. I will. Now, not a sound out of you. Until this danger blows over, I must keep you absolutely silent. I do for you, gentlemen. Uh, Sergeant Burns. This is Sergeant McAfee, homicide. May I have your name, please, sir? Professor Frankenstein. Just making a house to house checkup. Oh, of course. Won't you, uh, won't you gentlemen come in? We won't take out much of your time. It's about this fiend that's operating in this neighborhood. Yes, I know. I've read the newspapers. Dreadful. Tell me, Professor, have you heard or seen anything of a prowler or a peeping Tom? No, I'm afraid I have nothing to report. At least on this front, all quiet. Well, if you hear or see anything of a suspicious nature... I'll notify you at once. By the way, gentlemen, has anyone actually seen him? I mean, to guide me, could you give me a description of this so-called fiend? Well, that's just it. Six people see a suspect, and you get six different descriptions. Well, that's a human failing. Under the stress of panic or fear, our minds do strange things. Our eyes see strange visions. Yes, but they all agree on one thing. Whoever he is, his face would scare a ghost. Well, that's one detail I surely will remember. If I see or hear anything suspicious, I'll let you know. Thank you. Good night. Good night.
Margaret, who is this man? Oh, darling, this is Mr. Saxton. He's from a jewelry company. Saxton and Sons, we're the oldest firm. What's he doing here? Well, I asked him to come. For the big day drawing close. Come on, dear, I need your help to select an engagement ring and a wedding band. We have some excellent sets, sir. Won't take but a moment to show them to you. Now, that three-carat square cut, without a flaw, the one your fiancé is wearing, with wedding ring to match, we call that set Joy in Mayfair. Why, all the very best people are buying it. I don't care what the best people are buying. Beauty calls to beauty, and your pretty fiancé should have the very best. Don't you tell me what my fiancé should or should not have. Get out! Perhaps another time. Just get out! Now, Margaret, I suppose to make me feel guilty, you're gonna burst into tears. I'm too furious to cry. You know I gave strict orders not to be interrupted. And today of all days, when I've already lost precious time. I thought the great man could spare his fiance a few moments. And you know I do not allow strangers in this house. Well, he's nothing but a harmless salesman. He didn't come in here with a tape measure or, or a magnifying glass and, and fingerprint powder. I don't care. I don't want any strangers in this house. Why? Are you hiding something? What do you mean by that? I mean that I know you are hiding something. You explain yourself. I don't know what you're trying to prove or how, but I saw your great scientific experiment. I saw your monster. You actually saw him? Yes, in the vault in the cellar, where you and Dr. Carlton work so feverishly day and night. Yes, I saw him. How did you get in? I took an impression of the lock and had this key made. Well, I must say, my dear, you certainly are resourceful. I reasoned it out, and I, I came to the conclusion you didn't want to marry a fool, a puppet who would simply obey you blindly. I had the feeling I had the right to know what you were doing. I'm not brilliant, but as your future wife, I felt I, felt I should know what you were striving for, to help me to understand you better, perhaps love you better. For better or for worse, darling, I do love you. You know, Margaret, I don't deserve you. I'm glad you found out for yourself. I like that quality in you, initiative. It sets you apart from other women. In time, I would have told you about my secret, but you've convinced me that it's better that you know now. Don't worry, darling. Your secret's safe. Now two of us are guarding it. How well you put it. I'm not worried. I trust you more than any human being in the world. I can't tell you yet just what the master plan is for what you call the monster. Perhaps if I'd known, he wouldn't have frightened me. Well, he won't anymore. You must think of him as a creation of science, like a machine. Now, you wouldn't be afraid of a machine, would you? No, of course not. In the meantime, I think we should both be grateful to the monster. If possible, he's brought us even closer together. I love you. I don't need to tell you how I feel about you. Oh, I'm ashamed of myself. My bad manners, my lack of consideration for you. Here you are, darling. Now, you take this down to the jeweler and buy that uh, matched set. What was it called? Joy in Mayfair? And <laughs> you just fill in the amount. And tonight at dinner, I want to see you wearing the engagement ring. All right, darling. <laughs> oh, do you still want me to keep the key to the vault? Well, of course you keep it. Just another proof of my trust. Well, my boy, I think we're safe. The storm has blown over. You're very lucky. Two or three days, and the police have other crimes to think about. What are you brooding about? I keep thinking of the day when I can go out and be among people, and they won't run away from me. The day when I'll have my new faith. Well, actually, I was planning to begin on that tomorrow. You were? Please do. Please. Uh, unfortunately, someone has interfered with our plans. Who? Tell me who. 
A woman. A, uh, well, a young woman who works for me. The one I saw? Yes. Yeah, she sneaked in here against my express orders. You know, I gave those orders because I was thinking of your welfare entirely. By the way, did she uh, say anything to you? No. I frightened her. She screamed and ran away. Well, that's just what I was afraid of. What will she do? I've done my best to protect you. But now she threatens to go to the authorities. Tell them. They'll tie you in with a murder, of course. Then they'll come and get you and take you away. Probably they'll, they'll destroy you. And you'll never have a new face. She would do all that? Yes. Unless we stop her. We must stop her. I agree. How? If you'll do exactly as I tell you. Darling, I'm afraid I'm going to need your help. Of course, dear. Telephone calls, errands, dictation. You certainly have a good eye for trinkets. You call that a trinket? The last thing I do at night and the first thing I do in the morning is look at it. I value it very much. Really? Well, it's very sweet of you to say that. Now, tell me, how do you want me to pay for it? Pay for it? Well, I mean, show my gratitude. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. You were about to ask me to do something for you. Oh, yes, yes. Well, this is it. As you know, Dr. Carlton had to leave town to buy some new parts for our syncretin. I'm afraid he may be gone for two or three days. Well, so long as you're here, I won't miss him. Uh, I will. I mean, as my assistant. And that's where you come in. Will you be my assistant? It's meeting time for our young man. Well, of course, dear. You're not afraid? No. He's as gentle as a baby at feeding time. You're sure you're not afraid? I'll regard him the same as you, a, a creation of science. I'll go along, I'll help. Good. The hypodermic and the fluid are downstairs. Shall we go? Go ahead, my dear, you open the door. Use your own key, the one you so ingeniously had made. Well, my boy, you look a little off your feed. But I'll wager we'll soon change that, eh, Margaret? Would you get the hypodermic here? It's right there. It's sterile. Sit down, Margaret. Now we have to find just the right spot at the vein. Ah, there it is. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. I'll be right back, dear. I'm just going upstairs to get a supplementary vitamins. You hurt me. But I also fed you. There, it's all over. You want to hurt me some more? No, I don't. Sometimes we can't avoid giving pain, even to friends. You're not my friend. Yes, I am. You only say that, but you're not! You want to see me killed? No, I don't. I... I want to see you live. You don't! You don't! <laughs> <laughs> your work well. You've earned your reward. 
My new face? Exactly. Tonight, I'm going to lead you out of this darkness. We'll go among people, discreetly, of course. You'll be able to pick the face that pleases you. Then it will be yours. Well, my boy, you enjoying the ride? Night air is stimulating, isn't it? I like to breathe, but I'm afraid to be in a car. Well, that's natural. You were killed in one. The memory of that crash was embedded in your brain. Will I always be afraid? No, you'll get over it. You're young. And after I've grafted on your new face, life for you will really begin. You mean that after you give me another face? New impressions will crowd in, one on top of the other. Life will become fresh and exciting. It'll take time and patience. But someday, after we have baffled the learned men of science, I'll tell the entire world the truth. How you were reborn. How I fashioned you from different parts, breathed life into you. Pumped knowledge and wisdom into a brain that was hidden in a corpse. Then I'll be honored by the entire world having brought mankind one step further in the eternal battle against death. face. It's rather handsome, I thought. Even drugged by passion, it has brightness, intelligence. Does it meet with your approval? I'll be very quiet. gave strict orders that she mustn't be disturbed. Well, maybe you can help us. Just tell us what she told you when she got home. She couldn't say very much. Every word was agony. Just that she suddenly saw this monster, this unknown thing, through the car window. He had only one eye and not much face. And he just looked at Bob. Then she screamed and fainted. She heard no more, saw no struggle? When she came to, Bob was gone. The keys were still in the ignition. How she was able to drive home, I'll never know. But she stumbled in, panicked, and screamed until the doctor gave her a sedative. Well, has she said anything since? Only the boy's name. She keeps moaning, Bob, Bob. The one who did this, you think it's the same as... Well, maybe this time it's just a hoax. It could be some school kids getting in charge out of scaring people, or maybe a jealous rival. Did she have many boyfriends? She was seeing Bob pretty steadily. He was her first date. Well, did he have any enemies? Not that I know of. He's popular in school. He's a quiet boy, lives with his aunt. We know we've spoken to her. What will you do? Well, we'll go over the car and check the place, and as soon as we find something, we'll let you know. He may turn up himself any time and tell you it was all a practical joke. I hope so. I certainly hope so. Is this Bob? Yes. Arlene took it in our backyard. Yeah, Good-looking boy. Quite handsome.
quite, quite handsome. Here, my boy. Well, all the new equipment is in the trunk of the car. Acquired discreetly in four different cities, as you instructed. Good. Some special coils for raising voltage, magnetic generators, and a variety of small parts. Excellent. Well, we're prepared for anything. Now, as a small reward, let me pour you some of this sherry. It's really quite exceptional. Superbly dry. A caress to the palate. I quite agree. Excellent. You know, I can never understand the American passion for sweet wines. Barbaric. Well, give us some more time, Professor Frankenstein. After all, it takes centuries to become as civilized as you are. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not being critical, nor ungrateful. America's been very hospitable to me. And I think of what I've accomplished here, I shall remember it always with deep gratitude. By the way, what's become of your housekeeper, Mrs. Dietrich? Oh, I let her go. She had an offer from a wealthy invalid. It meant permanent security for her, and since I'm leaving in two days, well, we'll just have to fend for ourselves. <laughs> and while I'm asking questions, and I hope this isn't indiscreet, where's your fiancé? Well, Margaret is, uh, gone. She disappeared. Ah, oh, perfidy. Thy name is woman. Quit me cold. After I'd stolen precious hours away from the experiment to... to select this for her. An engagement ring. It was rather expensive, too. That's a pity. You mean she just up and disappeared? Packed up all her things, secretly. Left me rather a bleak note, something to the effect that our marriage just wouldn't work out. And all this after I had not only offered her my heart, but also my deep faith and trust. Did she go back to the hospital? No, no, I telephoned there immediately. I hoped I might be able to persuade her to change her mind, but, well, she just disappeared. Well, I suppose it's understandable in a way, and very embarrassing for her to have to admit that she'd given her heart even briefly to the wrong suitor. But isn't that the way of women? They make us poor men suffer for their blunders. Well, Doctor, in time, my heart will mend, but now I must lose myself in my work. I must devote myself to science and research to the exclusion of all other interests. I suppose it's the only thing left. I think you'll agree with me when I show you what I've accomplished. And believe me, this is far more significant than the flight of a silly emotional girl. This has to do with our young man. Something's happened to him? I would say so. Early this morning, before your arrival, I helped him off his table and gave him his mirror. Now, if you'll come down with me, you'll be the first to see his new face. New face? But how? Where did you Oh, get... come now, Doctor. Why burden yourself with unnecessary details? After all, we're both interested in the same thing, results. You come and look. I think you'll realize that we're practically at the end of our experiment. Show Dr. Carlton your new face. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Why, when the stitches are out, he'll pass for a normal, Quite attractive teenager. And you agree it's a success? Stupendous success. And what's more, no one will ever know. Well, I'm not so sure about that. After all, this new face wasn't grafted on from oddments. There's a chance of it being recognized, especially in this region. At any rate, I'm taking no risks. Well, what do you propose to do? I'll tell you, but first let me give him back his precious toy. There you are, my boy. Go back to reveling in your new face. I'll tell you what my plans are. Actually, our plans. We're going to take him to England. It'll be much safer to launch him there. But how? You need a passport? 
identity, a name, and assuming that you can safely prove all those, you can't keep him locked up in the cabin for the whole voyage. And after we land, customs, immigration, well, we'll come up against all kinds of questioning authorities. Oh, you do run ahead, my dear Carlton. How oh, you do run ahead. Those packing cases over there are stamped electrical apparatus. Actually, that's what they will contain. The parts you just purchased and the rest that we dismantle. They seem large enough. Larger. Each one of those cases has a false bottom. I don't think I quite understand. I assembled him, didn't I? I disassemble him here, preserve the parts, and later, in England, I reconstruct him. In my London laboratory, I have the same facilities, the same equipment, and the same assistant, you. Can't do that. It's too inhuman. It can't be a part of such a fiendish plan. You can and you will. You've got no choice. And actually, there's no time to be lost. Listen carefully. I'm going to place him on the operating table, ostensibly to remove the stitches in his new face. You'll see he'll be like a little lamb, consent to anything as long as it improves his countenance. Only this time I'm going to strap him down very firmly. I'll explain that it's, it's necessary to ensure no distortions to his features. I'll tell him the slightest move may jeopardize his precious new face. I assure you he'll cooperate like an angel. After I've got him strapped down, I want you to inject a double quantity of sodium pentothal. And then he'll feel nothing. My dear Dr. Carlton, in three days, you and I will be walking the deck of the Queen Mary, enjoying the ocean breezes, the company of charming passengers, and relishing the holiday we so justly deserve. Go ahead. Prepare for the operation and get the hypodermic ready. Well, my boy, you're quite proud of your new face, aren't you? Yes. With it, I can walk among people. They can see me and not be frightened. Not quite. But after I've removed the stitches, no one will be able to tell a thing. Then your new face will be yours permanently. Let me have the mirror. Don't get on the table, my boy. We've got to get you ready. This won't take long. It'll be quite, quite painless. It won't no. hurt. Believe me. Go ahead. Give him the pentathol. No, I don't want that. I know what's best for you. No. You want to hurt me? Go ahead, silence him, fool. His arm's not steady. No, you won't. You want to hurt me? to resist to let us take him away. You heard. They won't hurt you if you come. No, I won't! I'll 
never forget his face after the accident never